and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the last session of this e-learning series, Active Mobility Systems, Pandemic and Beyond. According to the World Road Statistics 2018, out of 199 countries analyzed, India has the maximum number of road accidents and accounts for 11% of world's road accident-related deaths, 84.7% of which occurred in the economically productive age group of 18 to 60 years. India also reported a total of 17.4% pedestrian cyclist death in 2018. Research points that city, uh, that city that have promoted planning for walking and cycling and have created infrastructure to support the same has seen significant increase in road safety. In India, besides road safety, lack of physical activity has also seen a growing public health concern. A pre-pandemic study by Indian Council of Medical Research revealed that less than 10% of Indians meet the World Health Organization recommendation for weekly 150 minutes of physical activity. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted this further and has re-emphasized on the need of physical activity and av availability of walking and cycling infrastructure for all. COVID-19 lockdowns imposed across the world have triggered an unprecedented change in urban mobility patterns. Many car-clogged cities witnessed record-breaking bicycle sales during the lockdowns. India saw bicycle sa sales multiply with nearly 5 million cycles sold between May and September 2020. Almost overnight, pedestrians and cyclists found a place of importance in urban mobility. The 11th Sustainable Development Goal and the new urban agenda aims at creating safe, accessible, inclusive, and affordable systems for cities, especially for pedestrian and cycle users. Walking and cycling often classified together as active transportation or alternative mobility or non-motorized transport are considered healthier modes of transportation. They're cost efficient, clean modes with low greenhouse gas emissions. To emphasize the growing relevance of alternate mobility in this post-pandemic urban world, here this afternoon we have a panel of experts to present their views on how open streets and pop-up NMT uh, are not just about surviving, surviving the pandemic. Instead, they are central to building sustainable cities. With this, I would like to welcome our first speaker of the day, Ashwati Dilip, Senior Project Manager, ITDP. Ashwati will speak about reclaiming streets for people. A national uh, it is a national initiative that is nudging cities to prioritize cycling and walking as a mode of choice. She, she will also highlight the need of collaboration between governments and various expert groups to facilitate the initiative. Ashwati, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Prerna. It's a pleasure to be here um, in this particular platform. And I'm so sorry for my, my slideshow is not working. And so uh, we're going to have uh, Himanshu uh, sort of sharing the screen for me. So I am Ashwati Dilip, and I represent the Institute uh, for Transportation and Development Policy. Um, we promote um, walking and cycling in cities across um, the country at the national, state, and city levels. So moving into uh, the next slide, it was in uh, March 2020 that, um, you know, when I was coming back from Berlin after the Transport and Climate Week, that I had no clue that in just two weeks time, the entire world would come to a halt. Next slide, please. But while the world had come to a halt, Walking and cycling was booming in cities across the country, like everywhere else in the world. Cycling was in huge demand, and our surveys had shown that cycling was expected to increase by 50 to 60%. Now, as Indian cities unlocked restrictions and life was getting back onto our streets, next slide, we actually got to see that motor vehicles and traffic were also coming back to our streets. Next slide. So this got us thinking that how can we support Indian cities place health and economy at the core of their COVID-19 recovery? Now, COVID-19 had highlighted the importance of streets as urban public spaces for health, recreation, and economic activities. Next slide. 
Now, cities across the world were showing how improving streets for walking was increasing retail sales by about 30%. New York had shown how 80,000 jobs during COVID-19 were saved through the Open Streets program, and making streets safer and livable for children also had benefits for health, air quality, and congestion. Next slide. Now, um, you know, over the years, uh, we've been in India for the last 20 years and working with cities across the country, we know that a few Indian cities had already begun reimagining its streets. Next slide. From vehicular conduits into paradises for people. Now, there are a whole bunch of nonprofit organizations working in cities across the country, trying to sort of help them transform themselves. But the change or the transformation has remained quite low if we had to speak about it. So the thought process that we were continuously sort of brainstorming was how can we support all Indian cities quickly transform their streets into walking and cycling havens? How can we give them a sense of what does streets feel like when you transform them for walking and cycling? And with this vision, we launched the national walking and cycling programs called the India Cycles for Change Challenge and the Streets for People Challenge in collaboration with the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs and the Smart Cities Mission. Next slide. So here, what we embraced or the, uh, the approach that we embraced was one of testing, learning and scaling. We encourage cities to test temporary low cost interventions for them to get an understanding of how spaces can transform. Then use the learnings from the pilots to create scale up proposals and build support for walking and cycling. So bringing together citizens at large to support this change. Now, next slide. While we were moving through every part of this particular challenge, we really wanted to work with the citizens, by the citizens, and for the citizens. And here, we aimed to get our cities to uh, host focus group discussions and perception surveys to listen to our city, uh, citizens, map their issues by having handlebar surveys, which were surveys on cycles with the citizens, and doing site surveys as well, and then creating design solutions by hosting design competitions. Next slide. Now, once the cities had worked on their phase one of testing, learning, and scaling up, now in the next stage, we're working with the cities to scale up their efforts for the long term. So the stage two of these challenges focus on implementing the scale up proposal, working with the cities and adopting non-motorized transport policy and allocating budget for the implementation of the scale up proposal and establishing a supportive Institutional frameworks such as building uh, healthy street cells, as well as committees to ensure long term sustainability of this project, even in the absence of these national challenges. Next slide. This brings us to the question how can cities actually embrace the national program? So, if you go into the next slide, um, more than 100 cities across the country have embraced walking and cycling challenges. Next slide. And the success of this challenge has been that we've been able to work with over 600 civil society organizations spread across the country. The truth or the big uh, you know, uh, aha moment for us was that we as individuals can only create so much change. But if you're able to collaborate and work with citizen groups in the cities that we want to transform, then the change can be a lot, a lot more. We then captured concerns of over 60,000 citizens across the country through perception surveys and discussions. Next. We also engaged thousands of citizens for campaigns and events. One you know, very important concern that we always heard from um, cities is that we're creating all of this infrastructure for walking and cycling. But the question mostly is, where are the pedestrians? Where are the cycles? So it's very important and uh, you know, we worked with citizens uh, and cities to have various campaigns and events promoting walking and cycling. Next slide. We also uh, encourage cities to sort of host city-led design competition, which encourage designers from their local cities to engage in the process of creating design solutions for their cities. And it was fantastic because in the next slide, you will notice that we were happy to, we were able to bring together over 2000 participants. Next slide, please. And these were young designers, uh, students, um, and experienced designers from across the country coming together to become the army of urban transformers who aim to transform cities and make them safe for walking and cycling. Next slide. Now, as we went into uh, creation of, uh, you know, as we went into 
going into what is the safe intervention that's required. If you could just go one slide back, I think you missed a slide. Um, what we did realize is that, okay, that's fine, sure, no problem. So uh, yeah, so um, just to speak about it, what we also realized that when we did our surveys, that it's not just interventions, it's also things like cycle training camps that uh, women needed. Women, many women did not know how to cycle. So they needed cycle training class. Some, uh, you know, a lot of people had cycles which needed to be repaired. So there needed to be cycle repair clinics. So these were all multiple interventions that cities did embrace uh, beyond the uh, pilot transformation. Cities identified about 400 kilometers for pilot transformation. Next slide. Um, this is a slide from Bangalore. And in the next slide, you will see, uh, you know, the pilot intervention that was done uh, by the city of Coimbatore as well. Next slide. Cities learned from these pilots. Uh, and with these learning, as you can see here, uh, is, it's a city of Kohima that you see towards uh, your left. And if you go to the next slide, they used all of these learnings to put together scale up plans of what needs to happen next and how they can expand. One, to convert the temporary interventions into permanent interventions, but also to how they can expand across the city. Next slide. Now, while they were developing these scale-up plans, it was also important to embed them into a healthy streets policy. So cities are now adopting a healthy streets policy, and here are the 10 pillars of the healthy streets policy. Next slide. We were also working with the cities on how to build institutional resilience through the creation of healthy streets cells and healthy streets committees. So this has been our journey so far with the cities. And if I could just say how we as the program supported Indian cities, next slide. One is that we provided technical assistance to the cities through workshops. Next, in the next slide, uh, you know, you'd see how we've been able to give them um, technical assistance through resources, multiple resources starting from design guidelines to even how you would send a media article out to how you would host a perception survey. All of these really step-by-step -step guidance was shared with the cities. We also established a collaboration and coordination platform to encourage cities to learn from one another, which was a fantastic experience through this particular process, seeing Chandigarh help Kochi and uh, you know Bangalore help uh, Surat and so on. Next slide. And all of this work has really helped us in paving new national programs as well. One that we've already launched is the Transport for All, and we're also looking to host a Buses for All program. So this has been our journey of creating happy cities through healthy streets. And once again, I'd just like to reinforce that the aha moment for us is that alone, we can only do so much, but together we can do, a, do much, much more. Thank you so much, once again. Thank you, Ashwati. This was this is a remarkable, uh, you know, step that is that you guys have, uh, you know, ventured on, and you know, hundred cities, six hundred citizen groups is is an amazing number. Where you know, we kind of often hear that you know how we should include communities, how we should you know bring them on board and stuff. Like that. I think this is already happening, and it's an example for others to see. Um, uh, we will come back with more questions to you, but uh, uh, I'm going to move to the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is Sonal Kulkarni, Senior Transport Planner, Directorate of Urban Land Transport. Uh, she will be sharing about uh, Bangalore and MT um, journey and will also uh, showcase key initiatives by uh, adult on walking and cycling during pandemic. Uh, she will also uh, touch upon uh, the role of government sector to achieve active mobility uh, in cities. Uh, over to you, Sonal. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Prerna. So uh, I'd just like to start by saying that, uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sonal Kulkarni. I'm a senior transport planner uh, and also now the head of uh, Center for Research and Innovation at uh, the Directorate of Urban Land Transport. Uh, and uh, so the Directorate of Urban Land Transport is a one of a kind of organization. It's a state level nodal agency uh, at the state government level of Karnataka. And its main focus and mandate is to plan, uh, design, implement and fund uh, sustainable urban mobility initiatives across cities in Karnataka. So um, 
just to move on to our uh, history of enabling enabling cycling in bengaluru uh, so a uh, pandemic was uh, so before pandemic i would like to say that uh, dalt has been working continuously on engaging with uh, the citizens and also to plan for uh, sustainable mobility in uh, bengaluru and other parts of uh, the state one such uh, uh, some of the initiatives that we have started off uh, much before the covid 19 hit us was uh, the tender shop projects i'm sure everyone has heard of it uh, it was one of uh, the kind projects where uh, the city actually took up uh, streets and uh, they redesigned it to actually give more uh, priority to pedestrians uh, and also give uniform carriageway and uh, beautify the streets uh, in the central business district in bangalore and then we also uh, started something called the cycle day in 2013 uh, we had actually just started uh, you know planning for cycle tracks in neighborhoods in bengaluru and that's when uh, some of the ngos and partners uh, from the city came across and uh, told us that uh, it's very important to actually do engagement before implementation so uh, that sort of hit chords with us and uh, we we understood that it's very important to actually build this kind of ownership within the uh, you know citizens of uh, actually owning the infrastructure that will be built in the future especially around cycling and the cycle day initiative has grown from strength to strength so it it started off as a one once a month initiative every sunday and now uh, like just before covid it it was uh, conducted in like many neighborhoods every sunday uh, and hosted by the uh, resident welfare associations in that particular neighborhood so it's become a very sustainable initiative just on on the lines of uh, cyclovia and then uh, dolt also uh, passed a legislation where uh, the karnataka non motorized transport agency was set up in 2018 um, and again it's one of its kind which uh, which primarily whose primary focus is to actually uh, build infrastructure around non motorized transport in uh, cities across karnataka and then we did the public bicycle sharing system in bengaluru and then the green link scheme came up which uh, uh, which is like a funding scheme by dolt for cities across karnataka to build more uh, pedestrian and cycling infrastructure and uh, of course there are some private initiatives like the cycle to work by the bicycle uh, bicycle mayor of bengaluru uh, which was also like we find it we we uh, calculate it as a part of the history of uh, whatever has been done in bengaluru so moving on uh, the as as I, all of us know that covid 19 hit us in 2020 and then um, i mean dalt found this as a perfect opportunity to actually do some pilots and uh, showcase some initiatives so uh, a corridor pilot was chosen on outer ring road and a pop up bicycle lane was uh, put in place in uh, less than 5 months i mean there are some uh, improvements that are going on happening but uh, you know it's it's one of its kind pop up bicycle infrastructure that has been put up in the city then we also showcased a different kind of a pilot where we integrated the bicycle infrastructure with the uh, pedestrian infrastructure in in the smart city area of bengaluru which is uh, sort of the core of bengaluru and uh, next we also piloted interventions uh, which are tactical interventions so uh, we also uh, as i was saying we also did some neighborhood pilot interventions in the form of tactical interventions to see and test some of the solutions that we had uh, designed uh, for making streets safer for cycling uh, cyclists and pedestrians and we did it with the people so uh, yeah so scaling up some of these pilot interventions uh, uh, to see how we can build a chain of collaboration with the citizens uh, as i said like adult believes in the uh, ethos of building with the people so uh, that's how it started cycle day 1.0 uh, which is an open streets initiative and then uh, even during the It, even during the uh, pilot intervention we actually crowdsource information on cycle routes that can be taken up through our uh, mark your cycle routes uh, you know initiative where people actually uh, rode along routes and sent us routes which you know uh, they generally use while either for their uh, you know daily commute or their uh, any other purposes and then we had a data led decision making which uh, we got data from the cycle to work platform from pbs data uh, proposal from various local communities um, and then uh, 
again, we did some uh, design sherets with uh, the neighborhood to actually, you know, uh, finalize proposals. And, and we are also doing an initiative, uh, which is an extension of Cycle Day 2.0, because uh, currently in the COVID-19 situation, we're not able to do the Cycle Day in its uh, original format. So now we are engaging with around seven communities to do a, something called the Sustainable Urban Mobility Accords. Uh, where we are giving the community uh, RWA 50 lakh uh, rupees to actually uh, come up with proposals and implement them uh, in their you know respective neighborhoods so yeah as i said like uh, the pop-up lanes were planned with the people the cyclists were there the police were there all the major government stakeholders were uh, present during the recce uh, and then of course, like there were a lot of uh, recce done, site inspections to retrofit uh, bicycle lanes with sidewalks, uh, the mark your cycle routes, which was a very which, which became very popular, and many people actually sent in their routes to us uh, to actually, and then we prioritize it based on uh, like the number of routes that have been showcased by as many people. So these were some of the outcomes of the crowdsourced. And we had, uh, like during this whole, uh, you know, the India Cycles for Change Challenge, which Ashwati spoke about, which even Bangalore was part of, we did many uh, such roundtable discussions uh, along with WRI between public and the government. We did rights for safety uh, and engaged more and more people to come out and ride and use the infrastructure that we're building. Uh, the cyclists also provided inputs for uh, designing of uh, the infrastructure. And um, as I was saying, like all the all the uh, infrastructure that was built was actually led by uh, data, and uh, either it be the PBS data that we have received, or uh, you know any other data that uh, we had hands on, we actually used that to make decisions to actually come up with routes and planning for uh, the cycle uh, tracks and pedestrian infrastructure. We've also done uh, so. I just want to showcase some of the data that uh, was used for coming up with the. Um, and how we used it to actually, you know, um, build this kind of a map, which is a cycling district map for the whole of uh, Bangalore. And then we also went ahead and did a uniform branding for the state of Karnataka for cycling. Uh, so we have now a brand manual uh, logo called Trintrin, and uh, that's what we're using in all our signages, our uh, lane markings and uh, all of that. So we, uh, all of this was also fueled by innovation. So uh, we brought in that element of innovation because we wanted the market and uh, the public also to think about solutions for making infrastructure better. That adds another layer of ownership and uh, you know enthusiasm from the public and the market side. So um, as, I, as I was speaking about the sustainable urban mobility accords, where we are uh, supporting seven communities at 50 lakh uh, uh, rupees, right now we are at a stage where we have done some data analysis and uh, the reports have been shared with the community and we are now helping them with uh, designing of proposals and strategies for their neighborhood. So some, uh, some innovations were also done by the BMTC, which is our uh, you know, transport corporation in uh, Bengaluru, uh, where they actually piloted some bicycle racks on their buses. And then we had the uh, sort of very famous uh, initiative uh, called the Clean Air Street Testbed, which we actually did on a, a newly like, you know, infrastructure street in Bangalore called Church Street. I'm sure many of you have heard of uh, Church Street, which was actually built to be a pedestrian only street. And we actually took this opportunity to, uh, as part of this test bed, uh, pedestrianize the street every weekend uh, for around six months to actually see what are the, uh, you know, uh, what are the quality of life measures that we will get from pedestrianizing a street. And also, uh, we trialed out many innovative, uh, you know, electric micro mobility solutions on the street where, you know, people got to actually uh, try it out, give feedback to the innovators and uh, so that the innovators can actually go, go back and, you know, uh, tweak their products and bring it back to the market. So, yeah, I mean, it was uh, packed with loads of fun. A lot of people uh, actually appreciated this initiative uh, and, and even today, actually, people uh, ask us to bring it back uh, and petitionize that street uh, on a daily basis. So some of the other innovative in, uh, uh, initiatives that we took up was we called for, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
designs for actually bicycle separators and these are the finalists that uh, you know uh, were chosen amongst all the people who participated so these will be uh, now actually we will be giving them grants to actually put them on some of the cycle tracks that we have designed in the strip in in bengaluru and uh, another facility that we actually uh, you know funded or uh, gave grant to was this uh, thing called the pedal port which is actually a, a solution that we are uh, you know putting up in various uh, you know parts of the city to for cyclists to actually uh, you know use it for repairs and uh, yeah use these tools for repairs and uh, puncture of uh, repairing their puncture and things like that so um, yeah with this i i just want to say that like yeah it's been a very exciting journey uh, and it's filled with a lot of uh, not only infrastructure but also planning with the people uh, doing a lot of innovations uh, and uh, including the market in this uh, whole initiative. So it, it's been an exciting past one year for uh, all of us promoting cycling and walking in cities. Uh, thank you, Sonal. This is uh, this is an uh, incredible journey that you shared with us. Um, clearly, Bangalore has made it a priority to bring uh, uh, NMT in a full throttle uh, situation for the city, and I think uh, rightly so. Um, uh, the only thing that you know kind of uh, does come back is you know it took a pandemic to kind of you know really step up to this uh, this kind of commitment. But nevertheless, you know uh, uh, the um, you know it's it's better to be uh, you know to be on this track than never so i think uh, with this i'm going to uh, definitely circle back with a couple of questions to you on the nuances that are uh, you know associated with such a uh, such a uh, large landmark sort of initiative by the city um moving ahead uh, i'm going to um, invite Rajiv Malagi, Manager of Sustainable Cities and Transport, WRI India. Um, the Bangalore story does not end with Sonal's uh, presentation. Uh, you know, Rajiv will be speaking about uh, the pop-up lane project of Bangalore and how smart cities um, uh, um, and smart cities and empty model road project uh, of uh, that has been taken up in collaboration with WRI and DALT uh, and smart cities. So Rajiv, over to you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Prina. And uh, can you see my screen and um, hear me well? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Oh, fine. Yeah. No, I, I agree with uh, Prina, and it's just uh, very interestingly turned out to be, uh, you know, the Bangalore taking the hotspot today um, for all our discussions um, with these examples overlapping with each of our presentations. Um, so bear with me, um, you might see a few similar slides to what um, Sonal has uh, shown uh, recently uh, in her presentation now. Um, but uh, I would probably try to just uh, bring in a slightly different angle, uh, more touching upon the city, but as well as, um, you know, what is the current status um, of cycling in the country, as well as, you know, especially with the pandemic um, lens over here. Uh, with that, uh, um, uh, my topic is, um, sorry, uh, my topic is pop-up permanent, where um, I'm essentially talking about uh, two main projects. One is the pop-up lane, um, which happened in the Outer Ring Road in the Bangalore city. Uh, but at the same time, um, some of these learnings got translated to make a few permanent um, implementation measure measures in the central business district um, of Bangalore. Um, so just to also talk about what happened, you know, this is something with the pandemic context as well. Uh, but in a larger sense, when we take um, cycling um, as, um, you know, a mode of transport in Indian cities, uh, it's most of the time, uh, you know, in an earlier sense, it was always related to the economic class um, as, as a primary, um, you know, kind of parameter. Um, and, and usually, um, you know, a lot of people uh, uh, cycling for a need-based, uh, you know, uh, requirement was related um, less, especially for the middle class and the upper middle class. However, that image um, has started has started to change in the recent years. Uh, there are a lot of people who are, um, you know, started to who have started to cycle um, for their day to day needs as well, and it's not just the lower income. Um, community as well, and and when the pandemic hit, uh, you know this this whole need 
uh, based um, aspect for cycling also kicked in. Um, and this is one of the examples of Bangalore where the whole concept of relief riders came in where um, a bunch of cyclists um, uh, started to uh, supply day-to-day -day, uh, essentials uh, for the residents of the city in probably in the area which they stay in on a radius of five to 10 kilometers, um, you know, within that sort of a thing. Um, that actually also led us to this opportunity of working on a pop-up lane project with the whole necessity that there is pandemic coming in and, and cycling and uh, walking is taking prominence. So what can we do in the city uh, to, to sort of provide that kind of a quick um, you know, infrastructure for people to cycle um, along the street? Uh, the other background to this story also is that um, you know, this particular road is uh, on the outer ring road, this stretch uh, is about 17 kilometers in length. Uh, but uh, interestingly, this is also dotted with a number of um, IT uh, tech parks and offices. Um, uh, so a lot of people were already cycling along this road. However, they felt that it would be interesting to have something more dedicated as a lane to improve the safety for cyclists. So if you um, sort of see in this picture uh, towards the right, um, it is the dedicated bus lane which already exists after the um, in the regular vehicular lane and and this is the service road so the idea was there was already a six meter um, sort of a width which is almost more than um, enough for two vehicles to pass through so the um, intent was to sort of scoop out a part of the space about 1.5 meters uh, width which is for a one-way um, you know cycling stretch and similarly the same uh, module would be repeated on the other side of the road as well that still left enough room for um, the vehicle um, the vehicles to still um, drive through this and 4.5 meters still comfortable width for two vehicles to cut across as well. Uh, that also led uh, through an inclusive approach where you know it was not just done as an infrastructural project where uh, you know we just had the designs and adopted them uh, and, and implemented them over there but it was more through a series of discussions with uh, different kinds of stakeholders right from um, you know, uh, the, the locals, the police commissioner, who is also an uh, avid cyclist, and, and there were cyclists who were already riding along the stretch, so sort of bring them in even for the site visits as well as uh, the design development. And even while decision making, uh, you know, the necessary feedbacks were taken to understand which are the best, um, you know, uh, uh, best stretches to choose as well as, you know, where the crossings need to happen, you know, what do we do at the junctions and so on and so forth. Uh, from that, uh, you know, kind of a success uh, where once we installed the pop-up lanes and there were certain learnings developed, um, there was also a bicycling uh, committee formed um, in the city, which consisted of uh, a bicycle enthusiasts and, uh, and other um, kind of government and uh, uh, expert group representatives uh, in which the MDO Smart City was also, uh, you know, um, started to in get involved as a part of uh, this particular group. And she suggested that, um, you know, while there are these streets already being developed in the Central Business District as a part of Smart City Initiative, why don't we try to integrate um, the idea of cycle track, uh, you know, to, to build, bring a holistic approach. Uh, for this street and also to make it an, an, an empty priority um, street um, um, along these stretches. So what we did was uh, we took about three to four roads as model roads um, and demonstrated these kind of proposals, uh, which had the right kind of material, right kind of designs and, and buffers, but also gave enough room and also built in a, some sense of safety for the vehiclist, uh, vehicular um, you know, um, passengers as well. Um, these were a few examples in terms of the design proposals were given and how um, right from pedestrians to cyclists to even uh, motorists, everyone was sort of prioritized uh, through the right kind of design. Um, and even with respect to decision making process, it was um, again um, talking to the internal team, but as well as the site engineers who were there to understand what are the complexities on um, on, on ground and, and what are the necessary modifications we need to make as a um, a part of the proposals. Uh, but while I'm talking about uh, Bangalore as a context, we also kind of um, zoomed out to just broadly understand, you know, what, what is the issue happening uh, to also 
talk about people not being able to cycle um, um, as much as you know we're looking at infrastructure being provided in the city uh, but if you see um, this particular graph it also shows that if there is a long um, distance or end to end commit which is required a majority of percentage of economically weaker section would prefer to just use cycle as a complete um, mode uh, for end to end commit rather than shifting multiple modes uh, uh, but with also with that, it also comes to the challenge where a lot of people don't even have access uh, to cycles um, at a basic level. Uh, so even uh, you know for them to own a cycle uh, still remains a challenge, and there uh, the country needs to have uh, or the cities either needs to have need to have those kind of measures in a way we can make sure that each one of them also gets to um, uh, access this particular mode. Um, and they, the city has been taking um, a few steps and initiatives in a way that uh, you know these multiple modes could be integrated as well. So that if I'm commuting for about let's say 15 or 20 or 30 kilometers in the city or from one end to other end of the city, um, it's not cycling as always option. I need to think and and worry about cycling long distances. But is there a way we can look at these kind of integrations where either I can you know clamp my cycle onto the onto a rack into a bus? Uh, or even carry a foldable cycle um, into a metro and, and finish my longer leg of uh, journey through these mass transits, but at the same time finish my first and last mile connectivity uh, with my cycle. So the city is already um, you know, trying to explore um, these kind of options which are critical. Uh, so this is the present um, you know, kind of a challenge which we are facing. And, and I felt as much as we are talking about proposals, it's not a pretty picture to say that uh, you know, everything is done and it's nice and good and, and we never go back and see how the project is actually functioning. But it's rather important to sort of monitor the project to understand has it been really successful or not or what else has to be uh, changed or modified in order to improve um, you know, uh, improve the um, you know quality or or um, you know capacity um, of cyclists um, on, along these stretches. Um, so if you see here, uh, this is still an intermediate stage where um, the signages have still um, not been put, the floor marking has not been put, and it is of course in process, uh, which is happening for this particular lane. Um, but uh, but but uh, it also led to a lot of two wheelers and motorists entering into this lane, assuming that it was actually a dedicated lane for motorists. So we did feel that there's a uh, there's a big gap. Um, in terms of not only just putting first level of infrastructure, but right kind of signage and messaging also starts um, sort of becoming important um, for the city. So it started with one uh, looking at, you know, de designing and installing the necessary signages wherever it was required. And that is, of course, in process. So we, we still see a lot of news articles recently being published that, you know, it's not been a successful project and because it, it all goes hand in hand right from infrastructure to right kind of awareness and the cyclists using it at the same time, how the right kind of communication happens for non cyclists in a way that um, you know they don't uh, own start owning um, the cycle tracks as uh, uh, for their um, respective modes. But at the same time, it also led to creating certain awareness programs and reaching out to people to sort of tell that you know there are these cycle tracks available and. Uh, and it have to be used efficiently. Uh, it's the same picture which I showed earlier, but just to also indicate that as much as um, you know, uh, there are people who are using it, there, there was a requirement for those kind of change makers um, or influential, um, you know, um, influence or key decision makers or influencing members um, of the city um, to sort of take um, decisions or taken or rather take stands, um, you know, of what has to go into these kind of projects. Uh, finally, just the third part, uh, talking about the idea of building back better, um, I would like to just say that um, as much as we talk about these projects and see this as infrastructure entity, there is much more than that which happens where it has to start, um, you know, with people as the center. But um, as much as uh, you know, there is supporting infrastructure which exists, uh, there are other components also which have to be addressed, right, from policies um, around cycling in terms of how it reflects back to um, a scaled up version of the city and how the right kind of regulations and policies 
have to start falling in place uh, in a way that you know it gets reflected onto um, the the necessary infrastructure on ground uh, but at the same time uh, there is necessary planning and budgeting which happens and then uh, there is active engagement and awareness building which is required because if you just have infrastructure but no people cycling on that which again um, is uh, really doesn't contribute to the success of the project and of course uh, ensuring safety um, you know and security for the the cyclists um, um, along this stretch and uh, to just look at uh, uh, the kind of a scale up version we went right from um, 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 a spot level infrastructure we did pop up planes and there are these different tools um, where we use tactical urbanism uh, urbanism as an intervention tool to translate that into a permanent implementation so cities have a huge potential to do something of this sort where we can test something and eventually make it permanent um, and um, ashwati and sonal have also sort of highlighted um, on these aspects already um, but also looking at um, kind of interactions and this one specifically was all women group um, kind of an interaction to understand what women cyclists um, women cyclists uh, feel um, in the city um, to sort of uh, cycle and and what what concerns them uh, to rather use or not use um, you know cycling as a mode and also looking at uh, at a national level where we need to think of um, a national level workshops um, and um, and events and activities and and um, definitely ITTP has taken up the whole streets for people and other uh, national initiatives which is eventually trickling down to um, uh, city level interventions and uh, with that I just wanted to close my presentation saying that creating a livable city is not about only uh, not only about uh, moving mobility systems, but also about creating momentum uh, in people to uh, adopt it. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Rajiv. I think um, as much as your presentation spoke about creation of infrastructure and you know uh, the and right uh, uh, size and you know opportunity for uh, the vulnerable groups, but uh, it also spoke about the bigger challenge of uh, the change you know that that behavioral change that we are looking for you know where uh, the challenge is that uh, we face today in our cities are you know at least mitigated if not completely omitted so i think uh, it's a it's a good start in the and, and I hope that uh, an example like Bangalore can actually become a reference point for many other cities who are currently grappling with how to go about doing this, uh, this entire intervention, especially when the cities are you know, in place and there are um, related nuances that needs to be taken care of. Uh, I think with this, I'm going to move to uh, the last uh, panelist for the day. Uh, Sonal Shah, Executive Director, Center for Sustainable and Equitable Cities. Uh, she will uh, be sharing uh, her learnings from global responses to active mobility in COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the emphasis uh, of her uh, conversation will be on how the moment, momentum on active mobility during the pandemic can be sustained in short and medium term. And uh, over to you, Sonal. Thank you so much, Prerna, and uh, thank you to NIUA and WRI uh, for uh, this opportunity. I'm very happy to have uh, my previous panelists set the context in India, and I think that some of the learnings that we will get from other cities might find uh, resonance, if you will. So uh, just uh, let me share my screen. Um, yeah, are you able to see my screen? Yes, yes, yes. go ahead. Okay, fantastic. So I, I'd just like to kind of uh, uh, share that um, in, in uh, around July of last year in 2020, the um, high volume transport uh, applied research program introduced a call for proposals on looking at COVID-19 and using it as an opportunity to promote um, sustainable mobility. So I, along with uh, four other researchers, uh, looked at different modes of urban transport and my colleague Vishnu and I, uh, from the Urban Catalysts, um, specifically looked at uh, non-motorized transport, that is walking and cycling. 
And uh, our objective through this research, which was conducted from November of 2020 to about June of 21, aimed to understand what were the key levers that had enabled cities to use the pandemic as an opportunity to prioritize walking and cycling. And, and we also wanted to understand how would these learnings then provide strategic guidance to cities in India on, on building and scaling walking and cycling infrastructure. What we had done is our process had involved um, um, an overview of uh, looking at uh, uh, cities globally and identifying what the key levers are. So I'll, I'll very briefly go over through what these are. We identified about eight levers which look at institutional framework, be it coordination for uh, non-motorized transport capacity within government agencies, financing, for walking and cycling in infrastructure, the role of leadership and political will, um, the role of policy and regulatory frameworks, as well as plans, strategies, and technical resources. Very importantly, the role of civil society and the private sector and communications, messaging, and outreach. And um, what, what we did is that, um, you know, it's, it's also important to understand that when we look at the world and we look at examples, what kind of knowledge are we getting in terms of which cities are doing what, right? And when we looked um, at, at some research that was conducted um, and released in August of, uh, up until August of 2020, we found that a majority of the interventions that were recorded were in North America, Europe and Central Asia, right? So therefore, we, it is very easy for us to know about a Paris, a London, a Milan, but we still will not know about interventions that are, for example, happening in um, low and middle income countries. And I think this was also one of the gaps that we wanted to fill um, in terms of trying to understand that um, if we had to look at levers, what did a comparison across cities from high income and low and middle income countries offer us. Uh, some of the interesting things that we noticed, and if you look on the right, is when they began to document the kind of measures that were being implemented, we see that a majority of these included, for example, expanding street space for walking or cycling, uh, or banning of motor vehicles as uh, two key kind of important uh, uh, interventions. In Europe, we saw that about 75% of the interventions focused on expanding or creating cycle lanes and cycle tracks, along with 20% of interventions focused on traffic calming and reduction. So which case studies uh, did we look at? So after a global review, we looked at four case studies or case cities to do a deep dive into. We looked at the cities of Addis Ababa, um, the Bogota, London, and Bangalore. So very happy to kind of see Bangalore being discussed here. And we reached out, in fact, we spoke, um, we reached out to all the panelists in this, uh, in this uh, webinar as well, and also had the opportunity to speak to, you know, some of them. In terms of kind of understanding the levers that had enabled uh, these cities to implement walking and cycling infrastructure. In the, uh, in the interest of time, I will only focus on two, um, Bogota and London, uh, for two reasons. One, because uh, I think these case studies are in a sense well known, and then so we may not need to go into a lot of detail about them. Um, and also because Bangalore has already been uh, discussed to a fair extent as well. So very quickly, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but this provides a timeline which identifies what has been done in Bogota since the 1970s up until 2016 and also un until uh, uh, 2021, which is uh, under the mayor mayorship uh, of Claudia Lopez. So very, very quickly, and what we did is we identified, we divided the levers uh, into 
we call, what we call the supply levers and the demand levers, right? So we wanted to understand is that when governments had to provide walking and cycling infrastructure, what were the levers that worked in particular cities? And I'm going to highlight a few of them, right? So particularly in the case of Bogota, and we know, for example, of um, the, the role of cyclovia, which we also identify as a demand lever because the organization of organizing of cyclovia actually institutionalized a culture of cycling in the city, even if it was cycling for recreation. However, as is commonly misunderstood that, you know, Cyclovia was being organized since the 1970s. What we found is that in, in the late 1990s, it was reorganized such that one institute, which is the Institute of Sports and Recreation became responsible for organizing cyclovias in Bogota. Uh, it was then headed by Gil Peñalosa at the time. And what, he did he, what did he also do is that he made an active attempt to involve civil society organizations, but also back into private sector funding to the extent that close to 25% of cyclovias financing comes from this source. What it allowed uh, uh, Bogota to do is expand Cyclovia not only in the well-off neighborhoods uh, of the city, but also create a network of 120 kilometers, right? So it um, it allowed this money, allowed them to hire volunteers, uh, get guards that, can, that are responsible for maintaining and organizing this event to such a scale on a weekly basis. So that was one on Cyclovia's side. And in the institutional framework, we see that it is the Institute of uh, Recreation and Sports. We have the Secretariat of Mobility, which is the nodal agency for mobility. And it has a dedicated team for non-motorized transport within it. It also has the Institute of Urban Development, which over a period of time, since the late 90s, if we will, um, specialized in construction of streets as well as maintenance of them. So it's not a design agency, but it has acquired a skill for uh, construction and maintenance. In terms of, and I'm going to do very select pieces over here, if, uh, if that is okay. This, the very important piece that will be relevant uh, in addition to the policy framework, the planning uh, was the financing as well as talking about a continuity in leadership. So we had uh, Antonis Mukus uh, as well as Pina Losa and uh, for them a continuity in leadership to, to extend and go, you know, to expand the network and build on the network created by others. Over the last few years, we have not seen, I mean, we have also seen some of these face challenges, but the interesting piece was, was this continuity. And to the point which might be interesting when we think about leadership and political will is that uh, Bogota, like London, which I will come to, has a dedicated NMG commissioner um, um, who is responsible for becoming the champion for walking and cycling in the city. That person is not a technical person per se, but becomes the face provides the political will, and also becomes responsible in a way to coordinate between different agencies. The third aspect that I would really like to uh, highlight is the role of civil society. Civil society has different roles to play, and the cyclovia have been organized with cycling groups in the city. Interestingly, what has also happened in Bogota, and you will see that in London as well, is that experts within civil society often also go into government in order to kind of extend that vision into government and, you know, as well, so that, so that they can continue, the, uh, continue to provide the needed technical support. So very, very, very quickly, uh, I just wanted to highlight that one of the key demand levers was the organizing of Cyclovia on a regular basis by a government authority using different kinds and sources of funds, right? Uh, in order to organize this event on a weekly basis. Uh, 
very, and I'll just kind of highlight some of the key levers like I've mentioned here. Uh, the, uh, the, the opportunity of the COVID-19 pandemic was that, that the history of buildings, so pre Pre-COVID, Bogota already had about 550 kilometers of cycling lanes in the city. And, and they had been organizing um, Cyclovia for a while as well. So they had the tender processes, specifications in place. Their contractors were trained, which allowed them to implement, uh, uh, you know, to implement fast. However, we are seeing some challenges as well because uh, there has uh, been a pushback against some of these interventions. And like I mentioned that uh, there is a dependence, if you will, on the mayor for coordination as well. One thing that I did not mention is that with the current mayor, uh, Claudia Lopez, she brought in a specific uh, perspective on gender, but also safety and security in order to ensure that the cycle cycling network is safe. Coming to London, um, I, again, won't go into too much detail. Uh, one thing that we see across these two cities is that this has taken time, right? If you see the timeline from London, it starts from 2000 with Ken Livingston. We had Boris Johnson, and then now we have Sadiq Khan, right? So we have, again, in this case, a continuity of mayors over the last 10 years who have who have who have um, sought to in, uh, you know build walking and cycling infrastructure in the in the city now we do understand tfl to transport for london as this you know this coordinating authority but we should remember that even tfl is only responsible with uh, for the major roads in the city and it also has to coordinate with boroughs. So the boroughs are responsible and own a majority of the street network. So Transport for London also has to work with the city council in the boroughs in order to ensure a continuous network as well. So just want to, uh, 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 and uh, want to acknowledge that. Again, what do we see? Uh, what are the key supply levers? One is it has benefited that you have one agency responsible for uh, 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 responsible for transport in the city. The surface transport division again has a dedicated team for non-motorized transport. And the way that TFL incentivizes boroughs is um, often through technical guidance and through financing. So one example that I may use is uh, the Transport for London worked with some of the outer boroughs um, in the city in order to implement what it called the mini Holland schemes. And these were aimed in order to introduce traffic calming measures, but also to create safer junctions um, and cycling infrastructure in the boroughs. And the key aspect of this was evidence, which I think we still have to see in Indian cities, very clear evidence of what was the situation before and what was the improvement after in order to um, increase adoption by other boroughs in the city as well. The, I, I'll just uh, highlight some of the key aspects here. We do know, I think this is very well known, um, the role that the central government played uh, through the gear change program. And it, it, uh, it committed about 2 billion pounds uh, uh, for non-motorized transport. And the interesting thing over here is that, um, you know, when Boris Johnson became the prime minister, you know, the, his, his work on NMT at the city level then kind of scaled to the national level. So uh, one of the other things that you see, for example, and, and I, I will not underscore enough the role of financing in being able to um, uh, in being able to uh, increase the uh, increased willingness to implement walking and cycling infrastructure. The other aspect that I would really and 
And what we are seeing in TFL is that the walking and cycling uh, um, funding is primarily coming through national grants. There are some challenges related to center and city because they both belong to different political parties. But, um, and this is a challenge, but uh, the most of the funding has come through national grants. One key aspect that I would also like to mention is uh, multiple cities in the UK have begun to create walking and cycling commissioners. Uh, London has it, Manchester has it, again, um, who report directly to the mayor, but whose role is to become that icon for, um, uh, for walking and cycling in the city. A very interesting model that we're seeing in London, uh, and, I, and I suspect many cities in the UK, is the role of civil society. So we see that one, they not only provide technical support, they are also custodians of infrastructures as some not-for-profit organizations are responsible for the maintenance of um, a UK's uh, cycling network. Uh, which is an, which I think is a very interesting uh, uh, model to consider. They also provide consulting services on the planning and design of non-motorized transport, particularly at the borough level, right, to the city council in the uh, boroughs. And another interesting model that we are seeing is that in addition to the organizing of car-free uh, car days and other events, multiple organizations have tied together to create a walking and cycling alliance that has then been able to negotiate very key uh, changes in the highway codes, in reviewing the gear change uh, program and so on and so forth. And I think this could be another learning for us in um, India as well. We, I think Ashwati already spoke about the healthy streets approach, which was uh, which was uh, pioneered by London in um, uh, under Mayor Sadiq Khan. So I won't kind of go into that, but I think I will share one image which is really important. So what do we what do we what are the key levers? Continuity in the focus on cycling as well as walking, linking individual and public health, right? So this is not only about individual health, but what is the impact on active travel on public health and public expenditure is what the Healthy Streets approach does. A dedicated walking and cycling team within TFL and civil society organizations who both provide technical support and consulting services. Uh, the, I have spoken about the role of evidence uh, that they have used in showing the benefits of the infrastructure um, and very actively uh, the national government um, and the city government have provided funding which is tied to the healthy streets approach. Just, uh, very quickly on the threats we are seeing like I mentioned a reliance on national grants for walking and cycling and varying attitudes uh, on this from the boroughs. So this is an image that actually I think exemplifies what I've been trying to say is that in this, uh, uh, it's part of the healthy streets approach, which not only shows the impact on individual health, but then will also go on to share impact on public health and public expenditure. Very briefly, what are the learnings for India? And you know, I think some of these have already been shared by my previous uh, panelists, but I'll just highlight some of the key pieces that I think uh, our review, our literature review, our interviews with over, I think, uh, 20 to 25 experts globally and validation with them has uh, shown. One is the data. Our pedestrians and cyclists are a silent majority and we need to publish annual reports and walking and cycling. Uh, our cities currently through the Smart Cities mission have a wide network of surveillance cameras. Can we not use these CCTV cameras to provide us this data and information on walking and cycling, which was not possible before? Organizing and sustained events, and I think sustenance is, uh, is important. We have a very interesting model in Bangalore where the approach is more decentralized, right? Uh, versus Bogota, which had a, which had a state agency leading this. Um, one of the big pieces that we are seeing, particularly in India, where, where there is low capacity within, within government officials vis-a-vis -vis non motorized transport, and often 
the decision makers on sustainable transport, if you will, or walking and cycling, don't necessarily use these uh, use these modes. So it is important to um, to to involve them when these events are organized, so that they are they understand and they can also personalize what the experience of a pedestrian and cyclist is. Um, I had spoken about the link between active mobility, individual health, so that individuals feel like we need to do this uh, and not only from an economic need. We have already spoken about walking and cycling action plans. I think uh, uh, Ashwati did mention this, having very clear goals and targets. And then one of the ways to kind of, you know, make this, make this a priority is to link these to outcomes on health, right? We have not seen road safety being, I think it's being used in some cities, I think Mumbai is doing it, but our approach to road safety to a large extent is still focused on black spot rectification. And it would be interesting to see how it could be leveraged better to, uh, to redesign streets for walking and cycling. Uh, I think there's an opportunity in the smart city uh, SPVs to see how their team can, their, how their teams and the capacity can be built into becoming dedicated teams for non-motorized transport and ensure that cities either create street design guidelines that are relevant to their context. Um, in some cities, and I know this is a challenge for Bangalore, that different agencies have their own street design guidelines. The city has not adopted one uh, guideline. So there are different standards depending on which organization is proposing a project. So that is the challenge of civil society participation in the absence of a uniform uh, street design guideline. Uh, I think Raji spoke about the creation of, uh, I think even Ashwati did, about the creation of non-motorized transport committees that, that take decisions on uh, that take decisions on the non-motorized transport plan, et cetera. Very quickly, in terms of financing and funding uh, channels, I think one of the biggest maybe limitations we are seeing is any clear budget allocation from the national government um, or uh, on, on uh, walking and cycling in the post-COVID-19 uh, context. It's encouraging to hear that DULT is making some initiatives on, on that side. Um, when we're talking about capacity building, I think some of these we may already know, which is combining experiential learning with technical learning, uh, primarily, like I said, because our, most of our decision makers don't actually use these modes of transport. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning, I think this is already being done. And I think just learning a little bit from Bangalore as well, when we are looking at pilot projects, the first set of tender shop projects was bold right, where they took seven, seven roads in the city center uh, to demonstrate what it would take and how the street could transform. So this, this has a way of ensuring that we don't take short stretches as pilot projects, but we are really able to try and push for our slightly bolder uh, pilot projects, taking support not only from bureaucrats and civil society, but also involving politicians um, we still have to use data and evidence uh, for before and after implementation. We are not seeing that. Uh, we're looking forward to some results from the Church Street Initiative and encouraging uh, behavioral change. I think this was also uh, highlighted by Raji. Thank you. I uh, just want to say that these guidelines uh, have been published with NIUA and are also available on their website uh, and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sonal, for an elaborate uh, presentation. I think, uh, um, you know, this whole tie up on how the global examples can then be contextualized for Indian cities is an, is an interesting uh, uh, requirement because, you know, that's, that's where, you know, a lot, of, um, a lot of our stakeholders come back and say that, fine, this is happening in another part of the world. And, you know, we don't know how to kind of you know, do this for our own geography. But I think uh, that's well covered uh, in your conversation. And I think uh, uh, one of the important aspects that uh, came across is to me is the whole conversation of uh, continued leadership. 
I think um, this makes a very, very big difference. And um, we have seen uh, in our experience, we've seen initiatives uh, taken a back, taking a back seat, you know, when uh, things change and, you know, when there is a shift in or transition in the leadership. But uh, I think uh, over a period of time, uh, we have also seen that there is a bit of a, an acceptance on, you know, how we are looking at uh, certain urban transformations like, you know, strengthening the NMT infrastructure in Indian cities. Uh, it's, it's not something that is new to India, but, you know, it's just that we are, uh, we are reviving it in, in, of, in sorts and, you know, we're trying to kind of strengthen it in ways with new technology, new measures, uh, new uh, reforms. And I think that's, um, that's an interesting, um, and it's interesting to look at how different cities are, you know, uh, really taking uh, that initiative. Clearly, Bangalore has uh, is uh, the talk of the town, and I think uh, uh, the city has really taken up uh, uh, this entire initiative uh, very well. Uh, and, and definitely, we're looking forward to see more, you know, and 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 also how Bangalore will inspire other cities in India, and you know, can become an example for a reference and. Uh, you know, maybe um, visits, and then let's see how this pans out moving forward. Um, so, uh, with this, we actually are in our Q and A session, and I, and we have a couple of questions here. So, let me start with those questions, and uh, uh, and then maybe you know I can. Um, you know, feed my curiosity a little. Um, uh, so the first question uh, I have is with uh, for Rajiv. Uh, Rajiv, uh, there is a question for does uh, human psychology or behavior of walking and cycling also taken into consideration while designing the cycle infrastructure or pop-up lanes? If yes, then how did you really consider it while you were designing or preparing for it? Yeah, thanks, Perna, and um, yeah, thanks for that question um, as well. Um, I think uh, that answer to that is definitely yes, uh, but uh, as much as um, this psychology can be considered as a part of your key standpoints and key parameters when you're designing uh, these lanes and uh, tracks and other necessary infrastructure, but it has to be correlated with situation on ground and what are we going to do eventually as an end product um, you know for for this given uh, kind of a scenario uh, if you have to talk specifically about the outer ring road um, if i look at this project through um, you know a human behavior uh, point of view or a cyclist point of view maybe i think uh, it might require much more um, reach um, let's say there are neighborhoods surrounding um, this particular um, a, a longer or a linear stretch of cycling. I would rather choose a neighborhood and look at creating a larger network of cycle tracks rather than looking at a specific road which is going a long length. But I think um, the, the idea of doing this particular project was also um, not just behavior per se, which of course was addressed in the smaller nuances. It could be, let's say, um, the key uh, areas where the crossings happen, the key areas where the cycle tracks st start, or, or the necessary infrastructure, or the way even we decide where the cycle lane has to be put in the service, or either it's towards the right or towards the left. So, so it, it did uh, sort of include those kind of decisions have, which had to be taken. But I think the other bigger chunk, which also we had to consider was, uh, you know, the, the users themselves, right? So here there was a huge necessity or rather uh, the folks who were cycling to these um, IT parks were also functioning as the primary users because they were cycling in large numbers uh, along the stretch. And this, of course, was uh, th those, these of course with the numbers before pandemic which which had a, a drastic downfall but we aim to sort of do something even for the future um, you know post pandemic as well and we see the numbers rising recently but because there was a need that you know there were a lot of it parks who were located along this this entire linear stretch we decided we we will start with um, this particular stretch as the trunk line but of course, establish a bigger cycling district in the area to say that, you know, this can be scaled up towards creating smaller looped networks, uh, which adjoin uh, to this particular uh, trunk route. Uh, so to just uh, summarize my answer was, 
uh, the idea of behavior definitely is taken care of when we, we put uh, the necessary infrastructure in place. But uh, it will also, it also has to be sort of balanced out with other parameters um, which exist on site and then see what is the best combination which, uh, which works out for these kind of proposals. Thank you, Rajiv. I think, uh, uh, you know, I, I understand that, you know, this is how we usually kind of consider the psychology. Sometimes, um, you know, it is also uh, about considering the user perception and, you know, what sort of service we can do or have done around that. If uh, And I think I'm going to, with this, I'm going to actually move to Sonal Kulkarni. And Sonal, uh, one question to you is that, uh, you know, there is a question that uh, an audience has asked that there is a large segment of working population who cycle out of economic necessity. How are their roots or requirements incorporated when you had? So I understand that there is a crowdsourcing of information, but you know, uh, there's also a flip side to that that technology access is, is also a restricted access. There is a technology bias already that is being you know discussed about uh, uh, in various forums. So I'm just uh, a little curious on that. That what sort of uh, service did you really? Or are you planning to, you know, have, was it really done or are you, or is it in the pipeline or is it really a consideration at all uh, in the whole conversation of an empty story? Yeah, thank you for that question, Prerna. And uh, uh, just to let you know, actually, we uh, started off a livelihood cyclist survey uh, uh, spanning across the city of Bangalore with a partner of ours uh, called the BPAC, a Bangalore Political Action uh, Committee. And the uh, report has just been completed and we're going to release it next week. Uh, and uh, as you said, like we uh, we also had this thing that we were, we are crowdsourcing from people who can actually give out these routes, but uh, we don't know the, uh, you know, cycle uh, travel patterns of the livelihood cyclists. So uh, that's why we took up this uh, whole you know, initiative to go ahead and uh, do this kind of a survey. Uh, and interestingly, we found that uh, the livelihood cyclists actually don't actually ask for uh, infrastructure. What they're asking for is uh, better lighting because they actually travel at very, very odd times. You know, they, they travel either really early in the morning or like very late in the evenings. Uh, so uh, that's what actually was uh, a very, very good insight for us that uh, these cyclists actually uh, don't really depend on infrastructure, whether or not infrastructure is there, they're going to cycle because uh, that's the only mode that they can use. So uh, this report will be out soon. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, people can take a look at it. It will be on our website. So, so yeah. That is, and that's really great, Sonal, to know because this is something that um, usually we don't uh, see uh, this sort of study or this sort of survey that, you know, is, and, and I'm glad that uh, Bangalore has taken a step forward. And I think it is also, a, it is also learning for other cities because they have been questioning if we want to kind of include this or do this and strengthen this, how do we go about doing it? So I think it's, you start there and you start understanding the, uh, the necessity, it's, it's sort of a need-based assessment that you need to understand your city and, and the ecosystem and uh, the priorities that, uh, you know, the user groups have. So I think that's, uh, this. Uh, we're looking forward to, you know, look at that study definitely. And uh, uh, with this, I'm going to kind of go back to Ashwati. Ashwati, um, you know, I know IDDP has been doing work around streets and bettering streets over across the country for a very, very long time. Um, uh, uh, you have, uh, um, you know, launched several, several uh, challenges, cycles for change, streets for people, and then there are more that are upcoming. I'm just, um, you know, uh, wondering. Now, this is one challenge, which is a time-bound situation. That's That's one you know, limitation with the challenges. How do we kind of mainstream this, um, you know, going forward uh, that, so that, you know, even if there is no challenge, then there is still that sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, consideration while, while doing city development. And, and how does um, the role of um, collaboration of different agencies, you know, uh, how can it prove to be more, um, fruitful while while making this conversation more comprehensive or let's say uh, making it more inst uh, making it institutionalized you know making it uh, 
um, uh, as a way of life in of sorts, you know, and not just one challenge and then move to another challenge, just to keep that thing going. How do we institutionalize this? Sure, Prerna, that's a very, very, very relevant question. So we've been working, like you said, uh, in multiple cities across, like, in fact, decades. But uh, there hasn't been the kind of uptake for walking and cycling that you really want to see. And so uh, the challenge was just uh, an opportunity to sort of ignite the interest in cities across the country at a very quick pace. So, uh, you know, we've heard about Bangalore, we've heard about Chennai, we can hear about Mumbai, Bangalore, uh, I mean, Mumbai, Pune, Delhi. But what happens to Surat and Rajkot and Kohima and Kota and Udaipur, you know, like, um, how are we going to sort of transform all of those cities as well? So the challenge idea was that, like, you know, Sonal speaking about leadership, leadership plays such an important role. And when, what we realized is that when the national government sort of, ignites this or shares this challenge which gets cities to sort of learn from each other but also compete with each other and take action there seemed to be a very quick uptake of this saying that okay there is um you know uh, there is a direction that is being shown by the national government and let's see what is it that we can take and what is it that we can explore so that's what we've seen and that's what we think has been the role of the national government to sort of inspire and encourage cities to take action. And here again, like I would, uh, you know, really shout out to Dalt because while we've seen uh, cities across the country doing a lot of action, we noticed that Karnataka had a bunch of cities that was taking action. And this was largely because of the leadership um, and Dalt encouraging these cities to take that action and guiding them both technically and otherwise as well including giving them finances uh, where necessary. So there is a role for the national government to play in terms of uh, inspiring cities. There's a role for the state government to play in sort of, you know, encouraging them to take the next steps, but the action happens at the city level. And it is for the cities to take that action and where it's been successful. So again, coming to Bangalore, the reason why Bangalore has been so successful is because there's WRI supporting them on ground, there's DAL, there is the bicycle mayor, there are a whole group of other nonprofits who are coming together to support the city. We cannot make this transformation alone. Our only way, I, 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 I would repeat this n number of times, the only way we can do this transformation is through collaboration between multiple organizations. And wherever we work, we've seen that when there are these collaborators on ground, those cities have really shown a lot of transformation. Of course, the question, this challenge is not going to you know, go ahead for years. It is going to, going to come to an end. And what we have tried to look at is, you know, that's the reason why we are encouraging cities to create these policies. We're encouraging cities to create these walking uh, you know, cells and committees with all of these local partners. So, uh, you know, when the committee is created, ITDP is not in that committee, but a committee in Dalt uh, or in Bangalore would have WRI and Dalt as being uh, the bicycle mayor, as being those leading committee members. At the end, it is the champions in the city who's going to make those changes. And what we are trying to do as catalyst is creating that institutional structure that will allow for change to happen in the long term. What we're doing right now is igniting this interest and we hope that through the processes that we're setting up, there would be a sustainable future uh, you know, of transformation in our cities across the country. Thank you. Thank you, Ashwati. And I think that's... Uh very well put uh, coming back to you sonal i i wanted to kind of end the panel with you basically you know uh, we have been um, one of the important questions that has been popping in my mind is that uh, you know whatever examples that we hear about the initiatives that india is taking largely concentrating in the southern cities of india um, I don't know if that is correct or not, or it is just my perception, but, uh, but what I hear is, it is, is it, it is Karnataka, it is, you know, Bangalore, it is Chennai, you know, cities down south are really leading this uh, way. Um, how do we, how do we kind of, you know, ignite the similar passion in, in cities in north, uh, in west, in east? And especially East, and you know, I know a couple of cities in Northern India, have, you know, Haryana, a couple of cities in Haryana state has taken up certain very interesting initiatives. But you know, this is not yet mainstream. You know, if, if you 
talk about mainstreaming, this is not really mainstream. And how do we kind of also nudge the whole behavioral change in people, you know, while trying to, you know, put out, you know, a lot of times what we, what we face is that, you know, when we speak in such forums, it's a mutual acceptance on certain things. How do we go put it out to masses? How do we bring them on board? Uh, what could be some of the important steps that cities can really take? And you know, uh, and, and I know that cities are, you know, we have been working with the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs very closely on climate smart cities uh, assessments. And we realize that cities are actually grappling how to start, where to start. So I think uh, if you can kind of, in your experience, if you can share that, how we should go about doing this and mainstreaming this whole conversation. Yeah, I'll start with the second one, uh, which is on behavior change. Um, and I have some thoughts on, on the first. The one thing is, is that our Indian cities already have medium to high non-motorized and empty mode shares, right? The behavior change is there. I think there's no behavior change required. Behavior is there. Infrastructure has to change, right? So, uh, and 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 I think that's the key piece to, to remember. Um, and I think I'm just going to bring another thing and perhaps uh, as someone who works fairly strongly at the intersection of gender and mobility as well. You know, a majority of pedestrians in our cities are actually women. And, you know, when we talk about cycling, right, we don't talk about cycling for women uh, enough. Um, I mean, I don't think we talk about it. So when we do user surveys, let's remember, women are a very small percentage of users. And if your users are saying, don't create safe infrastructure, I think this is going to be a bit problematic, right? Because there's enough research that is telling us that um, some of the limitations, and I think Ashwati also pointed this out, around thinking about increasing cycling shares for women, which you could use as a way to increase cycling shares overall, access to bicycles, safer road infrastructure, both in terms of um, cycle tracks, traffic calming, street lighting, et cetera. We know these should, um, showing, I mean, teaching them how to cycle and also creating cycling groups for maintenance, et cetera, right? So I think we should really, really look at how we can uh, deliberately and pointedly, targetedly increase women cyclists in our cities. Right, and I think that might be the first big jump. The so to me, that behavior change will will can really happen. In terms of you know, I don't know about north south, but what we are seeing currently is uh, that our cities, many cities uh, at different scales, are implementing metro rail infrastructure. Right. And I think one of the first things that we can do in order to leverage this investment is to ensure that we have good NMT infrastructure along with this public transport uh, infrastructure that is being there. Because then to me, that is going to be not dependent on north, northern cities or southern cities, but any city that wants to build a uh, metro rail infrastructure. Uh, I think that can be one major uh, lever. I still think, and <laughs> I'll probably kind of say this, is that uh, we definitely and certainly need to see more leadership from the national government as far as financing for non-motorized transport is concerned. Uh, I, am, I think that, that that kind of leadership, both particularly in terms of financing, really needs to happen. And I think that could be a game changer in that. Great. Thank you so much. I think uh, this was one of the most uh, awaited panel as far as I'm concerned. And I think, uh, you know, you guys have really done 
a wonderful job for this. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I think we, we are just, uh, uh, just in time. And uh, what I'm going to also now do is invite an IUA to take a feedback uh, very quickly. Um, and also to mention that this is the last session uh, for this particular series. And I think we have had some interesting conversations. We will be circling back. And what I want to put out is that uh, as far as this conversation of alternate mobility is concerned, I think cities are still kind of struggling to develop uh, first the plans and then second the operationalization of those plans. And I think uh, uh, this in this particular forum, and I can um, um, I can say that you know this is the kind of support we uh, these cities would need a sort of hand holding of sorts when it comes to the technical understanding of what is required what are the critical levers how they can you know really um, leverage certain uh, collaborations and how they can bring a continued financing and backing to the initiatives that they intend to take but are struggling with and i think uh, uh, professionals on the platform are uh, available to kind of help and handhold cities. Uh, so with this, I'm going to request uh, Manjali from NIUA to take over uh, for the feedback. And we don't have uh, much participation today, but uh, this particular session is being recorded and will be sent out to a very, very large uh, audience. And I, I hope that uh, the cities will benefit from this conversation. And uh, Manjali, over to you. Thanks, Prerna. Uh, so um, we can have a quick feedback round. I'm going to put, am I audible? Yes, yes. Okay. Go ahead. Great. So I'm going to quickly put the uh, Mentimeter code on the chat box. So I would request the participants to please log on to www.menti.com and use the code given in the chat box, which is 7 double three eight zero five double one or there is a link mentioned in the chat box as, as well so uh, you could directly use the link to access the menti screen uh, please let me know if my screen is visible yes it is great so um requesting the participants to please log on to menti.com and use the, uh, use the code given on the screen which is seven double three eight zero five double one or you can directly use the link given in the chat box to access the menti screen directly uh, maybe we can wait a couple of seconds for the participants to join us uh, so i hope the participants have logged on to menti.com and um, so we can start with the first question uh, on a scale of one to five uh, five being the best how would you rate the session on the following parameters uh, with the relevance and usefulness of the content of today's session, uh, ease of understanding and the question answer session at the end, uh, which just happened and the interaction with the speakers. Great. I think we have a couple of answers here. Uh, moving on to the next question. Um, what are your key takeaways from the session, from today's session? Uh, this is a short answer type question. So maybe uh, the participants can drop in a sentence or two or a short, a few words uh, based on your takeaways from today's session. Great, I think uh, we can see a couple of answers on the screen. Uh, Bangru being a great example. Um, mass awareness is required. Leadership is the key. 
a great understanding of international, national, and city-wise approach is required. Okay, it's clashing with connect Karo. All right, so I think uh, we have a couple of good answers here. So moving on to the next question, uh, which is any other suggestion which the participants would like to uh, give us to enhance the e-learning series experience? Um, this would be relevant uh, for us to conduct the future sessions. Again, a short answer type question, so you can drop in a few words or a sentence. All right, we would keep in mind that uh, the events will not be clashing in future. Uh, compile products and case studies noted. Great, so I think we have a couple of answers here. So uh, I think that was the last question regarding the feedback. So I would now request uh, Prerna to uh, close the session. Uh, thank you so much, over to you Prerna. Thank you Manjali. Um, uh, so this is, uh, thank you everyone. Uh, I would, uh, before we part ways, I would request Vaishnavi Shankar to if she's around and she can you know join us. Uh, this is the last session we're we're closing today. This has been a great collaboration with NIUA and several partners uh, um, you know across the ten part series. And I think Vaishnavi, I'm going to you know leave the forum to you uh, to close. Uh, thank you so much for the continued support that uh, you guys have provided, and this has been an incredible journey uh, for us. Thanks, thanks, uh, Prerna. It's the same for us. I think when we started uh, discussing about the learning series, we didn't know it's <laughs> going to come to this end over here. So it's been an interesting journey with different topics that we've covered. And um, of course, like Prerna said, we're also trying, we've recorded all of these sessions. We'll try and disseminate it further uh, to make sure that it reaches a lot more people because the discussions and some of the case studies that have been discuss discussed are very, very useful, uh, not just for the cities, but for other professionals as well who are working in cities. So um, yeah, very happy to have done this collaboration and we'll try and disseminate this information further. Uh, thank you very much for all the speakers uh, and the other partners who've been part of this particular uh, series as well. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. This is with this we have we are going to end the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Prana. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you.